Hello, everybody. Welcome to part one of our reading of uh, the return of the divine Sophia, healing the earth through the lost wisdom's teachings of Jesus, Yeshua, Isis, and Mary Magdalene. Um, I know I said we were going to do our roundtable on the Sophia Code before we started this book, but it's been a little bit of a delay in scheduling that roundtable. That roundtable is coming up, but I thought I would just go ahead and start this book because I know everybody who's been aware we were going to do this book has been very, very excited. So we're going to go ahead and start it today. Um, I will be putting a link down in the description box if you haven't ordered this book yet and you want to follow along with your own copy. That link, again, will be in the description box. If money is tight for you right now and you can't order your own copy, that's totally fine because I'm going to literally be reading verbatim what she has written in the book. So you can just count this as an audiobook or something like that. I do want to mention that I do have sage burning off to the side here. So if you see smoke coming in front of the camera, that's what that is. It's just sage. And I also wanted to bring up my necklace. I had somebody ask about my necklace on a comment section because it is the evil eye. Now, this person was being very snarky, basically making it seem like I was wearing something nefarious, which is not true at all. This is, first of all, this is not the eye of Horus, which is what we see the controllers using even though the eye of horus is actually a positive thing they just inverted it this is the evil eye which is used to ward off hexes curse evil spirits all that kind of stuff i have it on my wrist as well and i also have a dream catcher that's above my bed that's also an evil eye too so this is not something that's bad and i just want to remind you guys once again once again darkness cannot create anything only the light can. So everything that the controllers have inverted in their own rituals originally came from the light. All right. And if we get rid of everything that the controllers have touched, we would have nothing left. Now, also, because these signs, these symbols were originally given to us by the light, they are very powerful, which is what the controllers know, which is why they stole them and inverted them. And it's our job to take that back. It's our job to take back what has been stolen from us. I also really want to emphasize this idea of derangement and delusional thinking. All right. Spell casting is very, very, very real. And part of derangement and part of delusional thinking is what is called black and white thinking painting something completely black or painting something completely white. Most things in life lie in shades of gray and it moves back and forth up that spectrum, depending on what energies are around it. All right. When we look at things in black and white, we go again into derangement and delusional thinking. Derangement and delusional thinking is a negative polarity. All right. So the spellcasters that are infiltrated into YouTube know this. All right. So they're doing this to you on purpose to make you go into derangement and delusional thinking. So I would just really, really, really hope that you guys would take this into consideration. Please read the law of one. Please do your own studies of spiritual scripture so that you understand what is happening to you. Okay. The other side of this understands all of this. They understand war tactics when it comes to spiritual warfare, and they're using everything against you. And they're hoping that you won't figure it out for yourself. All right. Take your power back. Take your fucking power back. All right. Don't go into delusional thinking. Don't go into derangement. Um, I want to do a video soon on Occam's razor, which is super important when we're looking at theories and stuff like that. Story for another day, video for another day. But I do kind of want to start to talk about this more because in my life, I've been very privileged to be able to deeply study these old scriptures and understand this stuff for my job all outside of YouTube. And it's, it would be um, negligent of me not to say something that would be karma that I would accumulate for myself. Now, again, um, I, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. I can give you all the information you need. I can tell you what books to read, what to study, but you have to be the one that actually takes the bull by the horns. That's claiming your sovereignty. That's true spirituality is claiming your own mind back. Okay. So I just wanted to put that out there. Once again, the evil eye is not bad. In fact, I feel like this evil eye has actually protected me. My dream. Well, hold on. I'll show you my dream catcher. Hold on. So this is my dream catcher that sits above my bed. It's an evil eye. And I was actually with Stephanie when I got this dream catcher. I got it up in Connecticut and I really needed it. Um, it turns out that I actually do know how to astro travel. The things you learn in this great awakening. 
And it's gotten really strong for me lately. And I've also had the ability to see portals, which um, Steph and I will talk about that again in a, another video. And a lot of this stuff happens to me at night. The astro traveling doesn't just happen to me at night. I can actually feel it now when it's about to happen. And Stephanie can attest to that. Um, there was one day we were driving and I felt it coming and we had to rush home so I could go sit down on the sofa and, and go. And I'm always only gone for like 30 minutes. It's never, never that long that I'm gone. Um, but anyway, um, I was in a shop with Stephanie and I was having some rough nights because I have the ability to see portals and I was, it was just rough. Well, again, we'll get into the details of that later. And i saw this dream catcher and something told me like, you have to, you have to buy that. That's what you have to buy. And the minute I bought that dream catcher, my nights got a lot more peaceful. Um, and so I do sleep with it above my bed. Now I sage it every night to make sure that it's, it's doing what it needs to do to protect me, to protect my vulnerability when I'm asleep. And so I just want to put that out there that these, these evil eyes are not bad, right? They're not bad. I mean, I, I'm, I'm just appalled at the derangement and the delusion um, that we're seeing on this side of, of, the, of this community. And we need to understand that these symbols and these signs have been around since the beginning of time. And they were given to us by the light. Again, it was the controllers that stole it and inverted it. And I'm very grateful for these evil eyes because it's allowed me again, the opportunity to actually get sleep. And I'm very grateful that um, God pointed that out to me so that I can very, um, in a very uh, healthy way, understand some of my abilities that I have and have had, but now are just kind of now coming more to fruition so that I learned how to control them and how to use them for the greater good of humanity. So I just want to put that out there. Okay. Just, I want to put that out there. Please be very careful that you're not falling into derangement or delusional thinking when it comes to what is good and what is bad. When you're in a war, like an actual war, not a spiritual war, both sides are using the same instruments, right? They're both using these, all sorts of stuff. They're both using the same tools, but for different purposes, right? Same thing in spiritual warfare. In spiritual warfare, both sides are using the same tools, okay? They're channeling different beings, but they're using the same tools. So we just need to be aware of that, okay? All right, let's get into the return of Divine Sophia. So we're going to start with the introduction, which is page one in my book. Today, perhaps more than any other time in human history, we are seeing the rebirth of the unity consciousness that incorporates many ancient streams of knowledge with a desire to write a new destiny for the human race. This rekindling of ancient wisdom with modern day mysticism is being brought about by the quest to bring deeper meaning into a world that appears to have lost it. A fast paced materialistic world that seems to be obsessed with violence, death, and killing. Perhaps one of the reasons this resurgence is needed is that we can see how badly the world needs balance. We find it personally in the stress of our daily lives, the imbalance of our relationships, and the ecological crisis of the earth herself. Yeah, we need balance. I was literally just talking about this with deranged thinking. When you find yourself in black and white thinking or derangement, you're out of balance. So, and I also, you know, a lot of this stuff that we're looking at with derangement and delusional thing thinking is coming from the ego and the ego is the false sense of self, as we've said many time on, times on this channel. And the ego really has power when the person's ego is being used coming from a place of fear. So people who have really big egos are in a huge state of fear. All right. And there is a difference between ego and confidence. Like for example, Mr. T. Mr. T is confident. That's not his ego. That's his confidence. If he was using his ego, he wouldn't have done what he did. Okay. Because the ego is vulnerable. When somebody again is cowardly, um, is not standing up for what's right because they're because of their pride, that's coming from a wound of fear. Yeah. The true self, the pure consciousness of soul doesn't have ego. But the ego just like in the Ramayana, the ego tries to steal the soul away from God. It's Ravana stealing Sita from Ram. All right. So we have to have that courage to understand that. And so if you feel yourself going into derangement or delusional thinking, ask yourself where you're feeling fear. What are you afraid of? Where are you lacking courage? Yet in the midst of this chaos, a new kind of human being is emerging. A being that I call the homo luminous, a man or woman of inner light who may perhaps be the next step in our evolution of species. Yes, and in saying this too, sometimes our ego has to get really big in order to provide that friction, right? We talk about the friction a lot. There has to be that friction in order for change to occur. If everything's nice and easy, change will never occur. 
These are people who yearn to create the type of world where war, pollution, and struggle are things of the past. We have an innate sense of sacredness of life and are committed to finding a way back to it. If you are reading this book, you may be one of these people. As forerunners to the more enlightened kind of human, we seek to move past the distractions in our outer world to find more eternal truth. We want to transcend the chaos of our heavy-handed politics, our material co-opted media, our patriarchal religions, and the dysfunctional patterns of our relationships that have been handed down by our families. We are people who search for the beautiful, the true, and the eternal. These luminous human beings know that in order to bring a new and better world into being, we must somehow align ourselves with these more eternal principles. If the world we are living in now is ever to be healed, exactly, the macro and the micro, again, that's why I keep saying the crux of this great awakening is you. You are the storm, your internal life. You're, you're an antenna of vibration, right? It's not, no one's coming to save you. No one's coming to save you. That's matrix thinking. That's matrix thinking for you to think that there has to be an elite group of people that are responsible for saving you. There is no such thing as an elite group of people. Everyone's elite. Everyone is spiritual royalty. You carry the spiritual DNA of God in you. So stop waiting for someone else to come and save you and save yourself. The minute we realize that we have to save ourselves, that's when shit changes, right? Stop thinking this is a movie. It's not a movie. If we believe this is a movie, then we ignore our gut. Because if it's a movie, there's a script. And if there's a script, that means the end is already written. So that means that if we have a feeling in our gut, then our gut must be wrong because we have to follow the script. Stop it. The movie talk is, is putting a spell on you to get us to go into a negative timeline. 100%. You are the storm. It's not a movie. It's a war. Go inside yourself, fix yourself, heal yourself, figure out who you are, and then shit changes. The Kennedys aren't going to save you. The Trumps aren't going to save you. You got to save yourself. And that is a mighty privilege to hold. But discovering what has caused this imbalance in the world is not an easy task. Untangling the strings of history, culture, religion, and power is not something generally discussed on the evening news. No, because... Religion is part of the news. It's religion is owned by the same people who own the news. It's all part of spellcasting. This book is a journey towards unraveling these elements of cultural belief that have caused us to fall out of rhythm with the cosmos. By understanding how our past has shaped our present and how our theological beliefs have programmed our societies, we can then choose whether to continue the path we are on or rewrite our own destinies. The mysteries of the past hold keys to recovering this inner balance that can help us transform our world. These ancient teachings were taught with the, in the great mystery schools some 4,000 years before the birth of Jesus or Yahshua and some 400 years after the crucifixion, which the crucifixion we know never happened because Yeshua, the, the real God, does not demand human sacrifice. Only Lucifer does. So Jesus is Mithra. Yeshua is the Christ, two different people. Sages associated with these mystery schools saw the universe as infinitely vast and also profoundly personal and embracing the concepts of both God within and the God without, concepts that we now call immanence and transcendence. They integrate the disciplines of philosophy, religion, and science into one unified field and they honor the creator of the universe as the divine father and mother of it all. At the heart of this wisdom is the inner alchemy that Jesus called the way or Yeshua called the way. Again, Jesus is Mithra. Yeshua is the Christ. It is the path of integration and transformation that embraces both the divine masculine and the divine feminine within the heart. It is the inner path of sacred union taught by Yeshua and by Magdalene. But these teachings have also been taught by Thoth, the god of wisdom in ancient Egypt, by the sages in Taoism in the Sufi world and in the old religions of the goddess with people who live close to the land and the natural cycles of nature. Intrinsic to the way is the reclaiming of the divine father, mother God within the heart. This creates a wave of enlightenment for ourselves and our societies, giving us the power to change our world. Many of these secrets were encoded in the language of sacred myth and stories so they could not be forgotten. Yet most of us can no longer translate the meaning behind the symbolism steeped as we are in a less than enlightened society. 
It is only now, as we embrace the sciences of astronomy, cosmology, genetics, biology, and quantum physics, that we are really beginning to understand how these myths are founded on deeper truths. This book is a journey into the teachings of the goddess, the inner alchemy of sacred union, the wisdom of the masters, and the path that will lead us back to the wholeness as a planet. As a longtime student of these mysteries, I am pleased to take you on a journey into the heart of this wisdom. To do so, I must go back to the beginning of my own journey and the discovery of the divine feminine. I will sh share parts of my story that will help you to discover a hidden world of wonder, beauty, and infinite possibilities, a world that the most famous mystics have taught their disciples in secret. I encourage you to take the journey with an open mind to consider that the imminent imbalance we see in our world around us is a result of something precious we have forgotten and that must now be remembered. This wisdom lies at the heart of all great religions and its discovery is the path of the true initiate. All right, so before we proceed further, I'm just going to call on uh, Gabriel, who is the Archangel of Communication, and I am going to call on Michael to also be here to protect this recording, protect the space, protect the vocals, and I'm also going to call on Sophia come in and help us get this message across help help me get the message across that you you want to come across as always i am just a conduit all right let's try this again so since this is my second time at reading chapter one and chapter two on this recording there are some things that i was able to reflect on last night when i realized i was going to have to do this again and one of the things that i've actually been reflecting on is this idea of a patriarchal society everybody wants to say oh we're coming out of a patriarchal society we're coming out of a patriarchal society we have to bring the divine feminine back blah, 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 sounds a lot like the feminist movement, right? And we know that the feminist movement has been hijacked. I am going to beg to differ though. I'm going to say that we haven't been in a patriarchal society. I'm going to say that we've been in a Luciferian society. Why do I say this? Because we know that divine creator, source creator, there is a divine masculine and there is a divine feminine. Of course, Sophia being the divine feminine, the, the creatress, the creator, the womb, the holy womb. But as I've said many times, even within a human body, so for me, I'm very, very feminine. I do identify as the divine feminine in, in a relationship, but I also carry masculine energy. The same thing with the masculine. The divine masculine also carries feminine energy. We spoke about this briefly with the one of the sections on the Magdalene Manuscript. When we took the divine feminine out of society, when we made her the prostitute, just like Magdalene was turned into the prostitute, that also took a part of the divine masculine away as well. So for me, like when I look at a perfectly balanced divine masculine, I'm looking at some a man or, or that energy of masculine, of divinity, as being the alpha, as being the protector, the provider, the strong one, but also having that intuitive side, that sensitive side. I've said before, there's nothing sexier than a man who can cry, right? When a man is showing you his emotions and he gets emotional, that's sexy. But also on the flip side, he's able to be strong and protect and be that masculine, that alpha energy, right? That's the balance. We know that women are born, little girls, women are born with a maternal instinct. Even though I don't have children, I very much do have a maternal instinct. I know most women do, even if they have, don't have kids, they have that instinct about them. Well, men are also born, divine masculines are also born with a paternal instinct. It's very common to see little boys playing with dolls sometimes. It doesn't mean anything. It just means that they're exploring their paternal instinct 
instinct. Now, I do know that these two energies are, are different, the maternal instinct and the paternal instinct. For example, I know that a woman becomes a mother the minute she finds out she's pregnant, where in most cases, a man becomes a father the minute he sees his baby for the first time. I know there's differences in that capacity because the woman is the one that actually has to carry the chalice, has to carry the baby. I know that women, like, for example, my mother used to say that she could smell it. She could smell it in the air if one of her kids was about to get sick. I know that women carry a little bit of a different maternal instinct than the men, but the men still have that intuitive feminine quality. It's just like for me as a woman, as the divine feminine, I totally want to be the feminine in my relationship, but I'm also very independent. And I want a man that's going to treat me like an equal. Yes, I want him to, to open the door for me. I think that's hot if you open the door for me. Yes, I do am working on my work right now, allowing a man pay for me. That's been hard for me um, because of past trauma, but allowing a man to actually pay the bill. Um, you know, having that man provide, that's something that I want, but also I'm also a human being and an equal to him. So that's balancing out the masculine with the feminine as well. I hope that makes sense. So what we're seeing from this patriarchal society isn't the divine masculine. The divine masculine is just as wounded as the divine feminine is. It's Luciferian. Okay. And we're going to talk, I think in the first chapter, she gets a little bit into this, like the old God, the God of the Bible being this judgmental God, this, you know, violent God. That's Lucifer right? That we know that the God of the Bible is Lucifer. So I just wanted to make that very clear. I think we have to start changing our view on this idea of a patriarchal society because it's not. We haven't been in a patriarchal society because the divine masculine has been wounded just as much as the divine feminine. They come together. They come in balance. If one is off balance, so is the other. I hope that makes sense. All right, let's get started on chapter one. So before chapter one, we get to part one. The departure. Humanity has imagined her as the immensity of cosmic space, as the moon, as the earth, and nature. She is the age-old symbol of the invisible dimension of soul and the instinctive intelligence that informs it. We live within her being, yet we know almost nothing about her. She is everything that is still unfathomed by us about the nature of the universe, matter, and the invisible energy that circulates through all the different aspects of her being. She spins and weaves the shimmering robe of life in which we live and through which we are connected to all cosmic life. Andrew Harvey and Anne Baring, The Divine Feminine. Chapter one, the priestess of Isis. In the beginning, there was Isis, oldest of the old, she was the goddess from whom all beings arose. As the creatrice, she gave birth to the sun when he rose upon this earth for the first time. Barbara Walker, the woman's encyclopedia of myths and secrets. I sat up abruptly in bed, still in the other world. The blue black shadows on the bedroom wall looked almost like hieroglyphics I had seen painted on the walls in the dream. Where was I now? Oh, I was asleep in the dormitory of some college. I had returned to school for my master's degree. Now I remembered. I turned my head, slowly remembering the strange extraterrestrial language that appeared on all four walls of the room only moments ago. They had looked like codes or symbols, some kind of light geometrics written vertically on the wall of the small college dorm room. As I fastened my eyes back on the wall, I could still make out the faint inscription of some of the symbols. How could they still be there? I wasn't still dreaming, was I? They seemed like characters in some ancient Egyptian language, and I zeroed in on them. My eyes came to rest on one in particular. It was a circle with a dot at the center. What did it mean? Abruptly, I heard the answer in my head. This is the beginning of all things, the beginning and the end, the alpha and the omega. I lay back down. How did I know this? It felt like a galactic language, universal among higher life forms. Somehow I knew that this symbol was a code for something much more ancient than our human tongue. It came from the language of light, the language of the angels. And this happens to me all the time. Um, actually, the other night I woke up and I reached for my phone and it was 11 o'clock at night. So it wasn't even midnight yet. And I was in a deep sleep, a deep, deep, deep sleep. And I woke up and I had no idea where I was. I didn't know who I was. 
And I have learned throughout this journey that a lot of times, you know, the Native Americans believed that our dream space was another reality where we lived. So we kind of went back and forth between two timelines. Now we kind of understand that as the quantum, that there is this idea of the quantum. And, and the law of one talks about this, the Cassiopeians talk about this, that sometimes those of us, especially if you're an older soul, your higher self, your higher soul is off. It's, it's like by locating. It's like what Hathor did. Your higher soul is off doing something while the lower soul is still here in the earth plane. And the more ascended you become on the earth plane, the more you can tap into both realities, if that makes sense. So a lot of people I know are feeling like they're battling at night. They're waking up tired. That's kind of what, what this philosophy is, is that you are tapping into this space within your being that's not necessarily the dream space but it's more of the quantum and i know in in more scientific studies that when we get to rem sleep which if you've been through um, massive trauma you're probably not going to rem sleep conversation for another day but our body does go into like a sort of um paralysis almost like like our body releases a chemical that paralyzes us so we don't act out our dreams right and it's so our body can um, regroup and heal from the day before well, what if that paralysis, that, that kind of paralyzing you for a moment is so that your soul can actually leave your body to go and accomplish some other task while your body is being held down so nothing can come in or come out of it? I hope that makes sense. But what she's talking about, I think a lot of us have experienced before. Um, Stephanie and I are going to go into a video soon over portals where this happened to me with a, a portal in her house where I literally woke up, got out of bed, checked the time and went and stood and watched a portal open and closed. Um, and I've seen a lot of weird shit in my life. I'm used to weird shit, but apparently I know how to close portals. I learned that. So I think a lot of us are, are the, the veil of amnesia is lifting. The more ascended we come, the more we work on ourselves and go inward, the more we can see the truth for what it is. I mean, that's part of the yoga practice, right? That's when the crux of the yoga practice is learning how to see the truth through the illusion, right? To, to let go of the illusion, the ego. And so I think the more we ascend, the more we work on ourselves, the more we become aware of what we're actually capable of. And the reality, the, the, the truth, what is it? Mark Twain said, uh, truth is stranger than fiction. Sure is. All right. Suddenly, I could not keep my eyes open. I slid back into sleep on the dormitory bed, succumbing once more to the dream time. Hours later, I awoke, disappointed to see that the astonishing writings had disappeared from the walls. Sitting up in bed, trying to remember, I finally forced myself to my feet. I hurriedly dressed and went down to the school library, a vast wood polished sanctuary with rows and rows of research books. I was determined to find some reference to the one symbol I could recall, the circle with a dot at the center. I was deep in study when a student assistant found me. Excuse me, miss, but there's a phone call for you, he said. For me, I queried. That was odd. No one even knew I was here. How could there possibly be a phone call for me? Surprised, I followed the young man back to the front desk. Yes, I said to the mouthpiece of the library phone, may I help you? Is this Trisha McCannon? The female voice on the other end of the line asked. The voice was cool, even and familiar. Yes, but who is this? We've called to tell you that your dreams are real, she said quietly. What? I uttered in astonishment. Who is this? There was a moment of hesitation. I am from the priestess of Isis, and that's all I am permitted to tell you at this time. The click of the phone was audible as she hung up. Unable to speak, I stood there astonished for a long time, looking at the phone. Whoever were the priests of Isis and why were they calling me? Furthermore, how did they even know about my dreams? I conjured up the symbols in my mind. The writing was so familiar. Years later, I was to discover that this symbol was the ancient glyph for the sun, the first principle of life. It was the shape of the alm sound created when chanted. It meant the Christ, the limitless light. It was also one of the members of the Council of Nine. And so, yes, the Alm sign, I actually have a tattoo of the Alm sign right here on the side of my, my chest, my ribcage. Only certain people see it, if you know what I mean. Even bathing suits cover it. Um, 
the om sign is is or the om symbol the om vibration is the vibration of god given to us by patanjali through the yoga sutras which were allegedly written about five thousand years ago and if you're going to take the course my course and we'll talk all about this because um in the yoga sutras patanjali you know the three stars of the yoga sutra again are purusha prakriti ishvara um prakriti nature purusha the soul ishvara is god and Patanjali basically says the only proper name for God is Om because Om is a vibrational sound without a beginning or without an end. And if you chant the Om sound, you feel the vibration, the residue of the, the vibration on your lips, which move down through your body. It's also, if, if you've never done this before, I would highly suggest doing this. If you can find a place in nature that's really far from traffic, from any type of towns, for me, I have to drive about two hours out of the city to go on onto the trails in Appalachia to find this type of peace. If you go like, like to a place where you can't even get phone service and you just sit by yourself and you just listen for a while, you will start to hear nature making the ohm sound because God is within us and without us. God runs through everything. God is the thread that weaves everything together. Right. And so that's the ohm sound. And so, yes, and it is the sound that many planets make. If you get, if you get close enough to listen, right. It's, it's a very soothing sound. Um, it's usually if you ever start a, med a mantra meditation, then usually Om is one of the first mantras you're given just to get comfortable with that Om, Om, Om sound. And it, it's a little bit more precise than that with the lips. And I, again, I'll go through that in the course and people who take the course, how to properly do it as far as a mantra. But yes, she is correct. And I also want to just point out if um, I have anybody watching that was born maybe after the year 2000, once upon a time, kids, we didn't have cell phones nor did we have caller ID. So having someone call you on a landline and not know who it, who it was, or that was normal. Like, but of course she said, no one knew she was at the library. So that was normal. And to call businesses looking for people was normal. For example, I still remember the phone number to the back office of my dad's clinic, um, where we used to call to talk to my dad. Uh, we would call the back office. This was again before cell phones. Uh, my, my landline growing up as a kid, I still remember it. I still remember my grandparents' landline. I still remember some of my aunt's landlines. I remember my friends growing up. I remember their parents' landlines. So this was normal and it was normal to pick up the phone and not know who was on the other end. There was once upon a time where we didn't have, even have caller ID. When, before we had caller ID at my house growing up, my sister and I used to race to the phone to see who could answer the phone first to see who was on the other other end of the phone. So um, that, that uh, if you were born after the year 2000, that might seem weird to you that someone called the library. But for those of us that were born before the year 2000, once upon a time, that was normal. All right. The phone beside the bed rang insistently. Without thought, I reached over to pick it up. This time, as I opened my eyes, I realized that I was at home in Atlanta. I was in bed. There was no library, no college campus, nothing except my strangely lucid dream. It had all taken place in the inner worlds. Now I was back in the world of photography, advertising, and work, and it was dawn. As I replaced the headset in its cradle, I slowly realized that I had had the dream within a dream, and there had been a double message within it, the priestess of Isis and some kind of language. I knew it was important, but I had no idea what it meant. I was still trying to make sense of things as I got into my real Honda sedan the next day and left for work. Who were the priests of Isis and why had they contacted me? Was this some sort of secret cult from Egypt? Did they still exist today? I started the ignition. And why had I remembered that symbol? I slipped my car into gear deep in the mystery. Two months later, the answer began to arrive. I had stopped for lunch at a new restaurant and there was a long wait. Atlanta is known. We are known as a foodie city. I'm not a foodie, but people do come to Atlanta for the food. Like we, we, we are known for that. So <laughs> to pass the time, I wandered into a beautiful gift shop called Aluminum. As I opened the door onto the richly appointed carpet, the store's exquisitely lit crystals and one of the kind joy looked unlike anything I'd ever seen before. Immediately, my eyes landed on an Egyptian statue. Transfixed, I went to stand before it letting my eyes sweep over the smooth black sculpture of a beautiful Egyptian woman with two tall feathers at the crown of her head. The saleswoman behind the counter leaned forward over the highly polished glass, fixing me with her eyes. Do you like Egyptian things? She asked in a voice softly modulated with power. I turned at the sound. 
She was probably 45 with a long mane of thick salt and pepper hair and a strong, attractive face. Her eyes were gray and piercing. I stammered, feeling a, a bit self-conscious. Yes, in fact, I had been having dreams about the priestesses of Isis. Her eyes widened slightly and then seemed to grow sharper, as if she were seeing something around me for the first time. She extended her hand slowly, never blinking for a moment. Welcome to Aluminum. My name is Shasta. I shook her hand. Hi, I'm Trisha. I said, feeling electricity go through me. Would you like to tell me about your dreams, she suggested. I blushed. Well, I'm not sure I even understand my dreams. I looked away, self-conscious, trying to decide how much to reveal. After all, since I had been working for many, many years with masters in my dream state and had been a clairvoyant from the time I was a child, I certainly couldn't assume that a perfect stranger would follow my line of thinking. I'm not sure you'd understand them either, I added lamely. Her eyes brightened and a mysterious smile played across her lips. Let's just say I might. I'm a high initiate of the priestess of Isis. This brings us to chapter two, The Magic House by the Grove. Now, before we get to chapter two, there's some things I want to talk about because she's going to bring up the concept of witches in this chapter. And if you mentioned right before we closed out chapter one, she mentioned that she had been a clairvoyant since she was a child. Now, this is something that I have recently discovered, and I kind of, I think I kind of knew this already because of my study into um, uh, Native Americans and the Skinwalkers and um, the Navajo and their look at uh, black magic and white magic. But I wanted to kind of propose this, this to you guys just to kind of, we, we know that the word witch has been very much inverted by the, the, the controllers. And there are really, really bad witches out there. There are really, really bad covens out there. I mean, dark covens have been what's been ruling our world for a while now. It's the battle we're up against, you know. Well, what has become apparent to me is that light workers are good witches are born they're born with abilities they're born partly ascended they still have amnesia but they have certain abilities i was born with certain abilities she the writer was born with certain abilities a lot of you watching were born with certain abilities you were born technically a witch in the good way a light worker right now what i have learned is that the dark covens the bad covens they're not born with abilities. They sell their soul for abilities. So most people who are of the light will have crazy childhood stories to tell you. I have crazy childhood stories to tell you with dealing with the other side of the veil and the quantum and things that happened to me a lot. Um, a lot of people I know were born with abilities, uh, especially in this, this uh, spiritual truth or community, were born with abilities that they're just now starting to understand. But if somebody who's doing magic didn't have anything weird in their childhood or wasn't born with any type of abilities and all of a sudden they're doing magic, they sold their soul. That's what happened. They sold their soul for something that that wasn't their rightful inheritance, right? Because white magic is when you learn how to use your abilities to work with God, to flow with nature. Black magic is when you use nature, you bend nature to your own will. Okay. So I want to put that out as because knowledge is power, right? And knowledge protects. So if you're working with someone that didn't have, wasn't born with abilities, then I would be very skeptical of working with that person because chances are they sold their soul. Right. And that's why we're starting to see some of these spiritual people and the truth or community shape shift on camera. They sold their soul. And why those of us who never sold our soul are not doing the shape shifting, but they are. I hope that makes sense. Now, she's going to talk about witches only being Wiccan. I don't agree with that. Wiccan is a very new religion. Um, I, I have some friends who are actually Wiccan and they're lovely people, but it's a new form of like paganism, right? So it's not, it's not the term witch isn't just given to this one religion because this religion is new. All right. So I just wanted to put that out as well. All right. Chapter two, the magic house by the grove. I am nature, the universal mother, mistress of all the elements, primordial child of time, sovereign of all things spiritual, queen of the dead, queen of the immortals, the single manifestation of all gods and goddesses that are. 
A week later, I pulled into the dead end street hidden in one of the oldest sections of the city of Atlanta. This was the address Shasta had given to me after extending an invitation for me to visit. It was a short road, perhaps less than 50 yards, and it appeared at the end of a triangle of vines and bushes. I parked on one side of the road, staring straight ahead of me. The house was supposed to be there. I read the address again, checking to be sure that I was on the right street. But all I could see was a forest of kudzu trees and vines. Suddenly, as if a veil had been removed from my eyes, I realized that I was looking at a little white cottage hidden among the greenery. It looked like a fairy house. Shells, crystals, flowers, and bones were strewn down the path that led to the front door. The wooden porch was full of deer skin, Indian blankets, rocking chairs, baskets of guards, and Native American dream catchers. And this is so funny. So Stephanie started reading this book before I started reading this book. And this was before she had come to Atlanta. And so she called me immediately and she was describing the neighborhood that this house was in, seeing if I would recognize the neighborhood. And I have to tell you guys, Atlanta, another thing Atlanta is known for, not only is it a foodie city, but it's also one of the greenest cities that you will ever visit. We're known for that. We have parks everywhere. And every time someone comes and visits me, they're always shocked at how green the city is. And so a lot of these neighborhoods, especially in the older sections of Atlanta, all, all are very, very dense with trees. I, I, like I live a block from, from uh, Piedmont Park and there's a section of Piedmont, Piedmont Park that's in the woods and it's in the middle of the city. So I don't know where this house is. I suspect, I have my suspicions that this house is either in Inman Park uh, Reynolds Town, Kirkwood, or off of East Atlanta Village near the Flat Shoals area. That's what I suspect, but I could be wrong. It could be in the Old West End, the Old Fourth Ward. There could be plenty of other places. This is a huge, huge city. So there could be many places where this house is located. And I will say that having like shelves and, and um, installations outside of the house, Atlanta is also a very eclectic city. It's a very artistic city. And we have a section here called um, Cabbage Town. It's very near Inman Park. Cabbage Town was an area where there used to be a mill. And so all the houses are mill houses. They all look very similar. But now Cabbage Town is probably the most bohemian part of Atlanta. And so all these houses, if you're ever in Atlanta, you just want to go walk around and see cool houses, go to Cabbage Town and just park your car and walk around the neighborhoods because all these houses have these huge installations, these really eclectic stuff in their front yard. And so that in itself is also not abnormal for Atlanta, Georgia to see this stuff outside, right? So this is not a house that you would just notice because a lot of houses are like this. All right. To one side of the front yard were old metal chairs overgrown with ivy. A hand knotted rope with brass bells served as a doorbell and on the front door behind the dilapidated screen swung a wooden heart. I stepped cautiously up onto the porch, looking at everything with wonder. Very different from my own lovely artistic, but very neat and proper house. This cottage felt very much alive. Its magic was palpable. I sent out my inner senses and I felt like decades of history were sequestered there. Ghosts of ancient wise women whispered in the air. A spirit house, I thought, feeling the power of the ancestors gathering around me as if they knew I had come. I felt as if I had just arrived in some Hans Christian Andersen fairy tale, and as I pulled on the bell rope, I realized that I was in a completely unchartered territory. Shasta came to the door. She practically purred as she led me into her quiet little cottage, humming with energy. My eyes drank in everything. The first room was completely empty, except for an old stone fireplace and four altars, one at each of the room's corners. I got a glimpse of the large coiled stuffed snake mounted high in one corner, a large statue of Mary in another with roses at her feet, and in a third corner, a cat head stained glass goddess about four feet tall staring back at me. Who was she? Egyptian, I thought, and then I was past her living room and moving into the kitchen. Now, um, I want to say too, because they're going to talk about this land and the only place I hope this house is not by is the land trust. I don't like the land trust here in Atlanta, Georgia. I've done things at the land trust before and it's fucking spooky. Like that is not good energy at the land trust. I really hope that this house is not in Candler Park by the land trust, because then I'm going to be like, 
very, very skeptical of this story. Um, the land, I mean, it's land, all land is God's land. So I know it can be cleansed, but the land trust is dodgy as hell. Like do not, I mean, there's been some, I'm sure I can feel it when you're there. There's been some crazy shit going on at the land, land trust. And they have a preschool over there. And I just would, I would never send my kid to a preschool, the land trust. It is some backwards bullshit demonic spirits on the land trust. So I, I hope that this is not where this cottage is located because, uh, but I also want to say, um, if we remember, I, you know, Stephanie and I have been working off these old maps that say, you know, that where I live in Georgia and the deep South in general is the old Egypt that where we think Egypt is today is not actually Egypt. And e the original Egypt is the deep South with making new Orleans, Alexandria, where the, where the famous library was, which makes sense because uh, new Orleans is magical making the Mississippi, the mighty Mississippi, the original Nile, right? And so when she's talking about, when she gets into talking about this land being part of a place of the priestess of Isis, is she saying that this was, Atlanta was one of the capitals of Egypt. It was one of the biggest cities. And we know Atlanta comes from Atlantis. We know that this city was originally ca called Marthasville. Why the hell did they change the name to Atlanta? They're, they always have to tell us the truth somewhere. You know, so I just wanted to put that out there. And also with ancient Egypt, when we're looking at Atlantis, the Egyptians carried the uh, faith of the Atlanteans, right? And we know that the Egyptians were not one race. They were all races. I mean, look at Magdalene. Magdalene was blonde hair, blue eyed like myself. She was Kentuckian. Her mother was Kentuckian. She did not look like what we, we would think an Egyptian would look like, but the Egyptians were all different races. It was just a group of people. And there was no specific race to the Egyptians. We see this in the hieroglyphics. We see this all sorts of people. So I want to put that out there too. So if you're a white person and you feel drawn to Egypt, chances are it's in your DNA as well, even though you're white, right? Okay. Would you like some tea? Shasta asked in a softly modulated voice. A white cat jumped down from the kitchen counter, looking up and meowed. There were four white wicker chairs with a small coffee table between them nestled beneath a set of double wide windows. This was clearly where she ate, read, and even served guests. Two other cats, looking profoundly pleased with their lounging activities, yawned up at me. Shasta moved one of them from a chair. Sit down, I'll put on the tea. While she was busy in the kitchen, I looked around, trying not to be rude. The cottage was laid out in a simple square pattern. At the left front was the living room with the kitchen to the rear. On the right side of the house, I guess, was probably Shasta's bedroom and somewhere tucked towards the back right was the bathroom. I have several herb choices, she said across the countertop. I make them fresh from my garden. Would you like some dandelion or catnip tea? I grow it wild here. I had never even heard of catnip or dandelion tea before. I had only had herb tea made from celestial seasoning boxes and having hot tea in the South is very, very rare. Most of the time, if you go into a Southerner's house, they are not gonna offer you hot tea. They're gonna offer you cold, sweet tea. I had never had hot tea until I was in college. My whole life, if you came over to somebody's house, a proper Southern woman has always has a picture of, of sweet tea. And I'm Damn it, I'm going to find my grandmother's, my dad's mother's recipe for sweet tea. It's somewhere. She, my grandmother, um, I know she didn't need her recipe. She just made it from scratch. But my grandmother grew up in South Georgia. Her family came up through New Orleans, allegedly. And um, she would put pineapple juice in her sweet tea. And she always had a pitcher, always. So um, so I'm going to find that recipe and share it one day. I've got to, I'll have to text some of my cousins and see if somebody has the recipe because that's some real special South, South Georgia sweet tea. All right. And nothing is hotter than South Georgia. I mean, talking about a bowl of hot soup, like you are constantly my grand, it's funny. My grandmother, my dad's mom, I know I've mentioned this before out of all of my family members, she was the one that was most like me or, or maybe I was most like her. Um, she was always, um, into the mystical side of life. She was very much into reincarnation. She, she would hide books on reincarnation under the bed for my grandfather. Um, you know, she, she started meditating 
long before meditation was even known in, in the deep South. She tried to teach me how to meditate when I was eight years old. And so I do feel like my grand, I mean, I know grandparents don't have favorite grandchildren. I get that. Like you don't have a favorite child, but I feel like there was a very special bond that my grandmother had with me because I think she saw a lot of herself in me. And I think she saw with my life that I was able to do things as a Southern woman that grew up in an upper, upper aristocratical Southern family. Both of my families were upper, upper class Southern families. So there's a, there was a, an expectation, you know, that the, the um, debutante, the cocktail parties, the country club, there was an expectation and going off to India and studying spirituality is not part of that expectation. And so I think my grandmother did, did as much as she could for her generation. You know, she went to college. She was a valedictorian of her college class. She kicked the ass, she kicked boys ass when it came to education. She was a master pianist. Um, she even went back and got her master's in psychology. She worked. That was crazy for a woman of her society to work. She worked. She was in a rotary club, you know, and I think that she, when I came along and she saw that same fire in me that questioned the church, questioned life, I questioned stuff. I think she kind of pushed me to, to go down this road a little bit further. And when I started going to India to study, a lot of my family members were not very happy about that. They did not think that that was something I should be doing, but her, she was very excited that I was going off to India all these years and studying. And every time I came home for a break from being in India, she would like want me to teach her stuff. At this point, towards the end, she already had Alzheimer's. She was already dealing with memory problems. But I tell you what, I would come into her house and she would immediately want me to teach her whatever I learned in India. And she was so fascinated and so interested. And, and anyway, I'm digressing. But she, I asked her once um, a few years ago, I think I have it on recording somewhere. I said, grandmother, what got you interested in meditation? What, from a woman that grew up on a, in, on a plantation in South Georgia on a dairy farm, what got you interested in this? There wasn't like, there was like yoga classes for you to go to in Quitman, Georgia. And she said, in all seriousness, she goes, you know, I think living in, growing up in such a hot climate, there were just days where all you could do was sit and stare. That's all you could do. And she goes, I think that's how I found meditation. It was just too hot to do anything else, but just sit and stare. And I like that answer. I also believe that here in the deep South. And I think this is why it's important that this book takes place in Atlanta. The deep South is magical. I mean, that was the whole point of why I started my channel. When I started my channel, I was only doing folklore and legends from the state of Georgia. That's why it's esoteric Atlanta. It's magical down here. There's no other place in the world that I would rather be from than the deep South. I find it a privilege that I was born in such a fantastically magical place. We have so much folklore. I grew up knowing that if you put red clay at your door, your enemies can't come in. I grew up knowing that if you put a, a broom upside down in your room, hags can't get to you because they have to count the bristles first before they can get to you. This is folklore I grew up with. I grew up around voodoo and hoodoo and with the church. And this is normal to me. I grew up with ghosts and uh, legends of, of shapeshifters. If you look on my channel, there's the story of uh, the girl who was a werewolf down in South Georgia, near where my grandmother was from. And I, I know that um, other places of the world are magical too, but they're just not as magical as the South. You go to th th this place breathes. This land is alive down here and it holds secrets and it holds legends and it holds information for anybody. It's it, it's thick with humidity and it's haunted and it talks to you. You know, it's uh, Stephanie and I are going to get into Salem. When I, when we went into Salem, I was appalled. There's no history in Salem. Are you kidding me? It looked like a movie set. You want to see history? Go to Charleston, South Carolina. Go to Savannah, Georgia. Go to New Orleans. Go to St. Augustine. Go to little towns around Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi. You're going to see more history, more cobblestones, more energy there than you will ever see in Salem, Massachusetts, which again, we'll get to when we cover the witch trials. But this is all important, guys, because this is, they're telling us there's something about the deep south. I think it's because this is Egypt. This is Egypt. All right. Let's keep going. When the tea is finished steeping, we'll go out and sit in the garden. Through the side window, I could see that the garden was wild with kudzu. 
I could also see a little area where the land had been cleared and vegetables planted. But, but beyond that, almost everything looked half hidden in green, the trees, the rocks, even the arched arbors of this magical little valley. From here, it looked like an enormous green vortex where the earth dropped away into the center of the yard, leaving the entire perimeter rimmed with trees. Wild roses covered the old fence around the property, making her home almost invisible to those not trained to know what they were looking for. The grove is hundreds of years old, Shasta explained as she saw me studying it. Women have been coming here for centuries to pray. Let's read that again. Women have been coming here for centuries to pray. Why is that? This is fucking Egypt. That's why that is. I am the keeper of the grove, along with my old friend, Jeremy. Jeremy, I asked. Her chin gestured to the little hidden house on the other side of the sanctuary. I had not seen it before. He is the guardian of the grove, just as I am the priestess. I wondered if he was half as fascinating as she was. Shasta poured the hot water from the kettle into our cups of dandelion. Do you like honey? I nodded. Shasta, do you have a restroom I can use? She smiled, gesturing. Go back to the living room and to the healing room. It's on the opposite side of the house. I wandered through the rooms, my eyes large as saucers. I saw turtle shells, snake skins, cow skulls, and fur throws. There were baskets of nards on, this, on several corners and a bookcase of well-loved books. This time, as I passed the altar with a beautiful cat-headed being, I studied it more carefully. It looked majestic and proud definitely Egyptian. In a second corner, I realized that a white wolf pelt was draped beneath the white cow skull. What could that mean? One thing I knew though, the whole place felt alive. As I entered her bedroom, which she had called the healing room, I noticed how pristine it was. Lace, candles, rattles lay near the mirror above the dresser and a large double bed with a white lace bedspread stood against one wall with a couple of overstuffed chairs. Then I was at the door of the bathroom. From the moment I entered it, I could tell that the house was watching me. A strange sort of power emanated right through the floorboards. There was one window that threw triangles of light into the room and the afternoon sun was subdued. Everything was white except the walls, the fixtures, the towels, the rugs, but the walls were painted purple with strange swirling symbols, spirals and portals on them. I felt as if I knew these images. Were they a part of the language I had seen in my dream? A shiver went through me. This was a place of power. It felt as if the living intelligence of the land was here, like some ancient being was watching. I knew that whatever energy the grove had, this room was one of his exit points, and it seemed as curious about me as I was about it. Shasta was ready with the tea when I returned. Interesting bathroom, I commented dryly. She gave me a sideways glance. I thought you'd like it. She held my eyes for a moment. It was watching me, I said. She smiled. Yes, I know. The grove lies at the intersection of two blind springs, springs that run underground but do not surface. This creates a powerful magnetic field through which River Woman can speak. Come, we'll go out into the duck garden. Shasta opened the door and stepped outside onto the porch into the afternoon sun. The light seemed to glisten off the railings, the teacups, even her earrings. I took a deep breath and I followed. So that's fascinating, guys. I have talked about the legend of the Fountain of Youth being in Atlanta, another, another legend we learned growing up. And allegedly the Fountain of Youth that Ponce de Leon was looking for when he came north is now under Ponce City Market in Atlanta. Ponce City Market is off of Ponce de Leon Road, which we just call Ponce here in Atlanta. And I do believe, as everything is inverted, that the um, controllers have their version of the Fountain of Youth and the light has its version of the Fountain of Youth. And maybe both are here in Atlanta. Maybe that's why the Olympics happened in 1996 in Atlanta. Were they harnessing that energy? I don't know, but that's interesting. Maybe, you know, think about legends and folklore. They, they don't just appear out of thin air. They, there's always some truth to them, right? So is that the actual fountain of youth? These two streams, these springs that run underground where the river woman speaks here in Atlanta, Georgia. River woman, I thought, contemplating the meaning of her words. Who was river woman? I thought she meant the primordial intelligence of water itself. As I thought of the water all over the world having an active intelligence, I realized that water passed through everything. Cities, mountains, meadows, towns, 
Water even passed through the ocean and the sky's rain. Water passed through humans and animals and returned to the earth. If water could communicate its vast wisdom to someone who truly knew how to listen, one could learn a great deal simply by sitting beside water. Shasta seemed to be reading my mind. In the ancient days, the women made their homes near water. This was not only practical, it was also for understanding. A wise woman from the village would go down to the water and listen each day. In this way, she would hear news from the spirit of the water about all the happenings in other villages upstream. She would know before anyone arrived to tell the elders this was part of the teachings of River Woman. I nodded, not even sure how to respond. It was an entirely new way of thinking. Think about it, Shasta went on. If all water is connected to the great ocean, then everything is connected. This is why the goddess was always called La Mer, Mary, Mary, or the Great Mother. That I disagree with because of my research. Mary was a demeaning name for women, not a good one. All right. So Jane Doe. She's the ultimate healer. On a planet like this one, a water planet, one can sit in this grove and learn a lot about what is happening all over the world just by being still. We picked up our mugs, descended the steps, and entered the magical glade. I followed her silently through the foliage into the back. Three huge grandfather oaks oversaw the little valley, and beyond it were even more woods, buffering her from the world. From one oak hung a rope swing. We had a rope swing in our front yard in our house growing up. I don't know if my mom actually, when she sold her house, I don't know if she actually took the swing with her. I kind of hope she did, but if she left it, then the new family gets to enjoy that rope swing. That rope swing hung in our front yard throughout my whole childhood. And damn, was that a, a strong rope swing. We got it. And I remember when we got it, when I was really little, um, there is this group of uh, shops called the Hammock Shops in uh, near Polly's Island, South Carolina. And that's my mom's family is from the coast of South Carolina. So we would spend our summers there. And we got it at the Hammock Shops when I was little. And that swing lasted it never broke. And I tell you, all the kids in the neighborhood were on it all the time. Like that rope swing, that was a good rope swing. So I'm sure that rope swing, if it's still hanging in that tree, carries all the energy, the good energy from all the little children who played on it. So including my sister and me. So rope swings are big in the South. The Grove looked for all the world as if we had stepped into an 18th century painting. Several alcove gardens had been hidden in foliage, and now Shasta led me into one of them. A statue of Maria of the Woods overhung the altar offering in half-melted candles, attested to the fact that other initiates had visited here. Mardi Gras beads, ceremonial objects, and prayer ties all hung from the trees, and a loose assortment of benches, rugs, tables, and candles were half-obscured beneath the canopy of foliage. An aura of reverence emanated from this place. Mary is the patron saint of our woods, Shasta explained. Many people have gathered here to speak to her. I nodded, not even able to formulate a question. Despite my years of spiritual training, this was all new to me. The healing energies of sacred ritual were gathered in the silence. Shall we sit? Shasta asked, leading me toward a wickered sofa where I could see down into the little bowl-shaped valley for the first time. There was a fire pit and four altars one for each direction. I could feel the power rising from the ground like a pulse. I knew that if I were left alone in this grove, I would be able to hear the earth speaking. Suddenly, I spotted three huge cauldrons turned upside down in a circle. The sight sent a shiver through me. I knew from my Christian upbringing that witches use cauldrons. What are those, I asked, pointing at them dubiously. She laughed, Amused by my fundamentalist sensibilities. Don't be afraid, she reassured me, patting my arm in a matronly manner. Cauldrons are only iron kettles, you know. People have cooked in them for centuries. I smiled sheepishly, feeling chagrined. My Southern Baptist training was rearing its head. The cauldron you see is like the womb of the earth, the womb of women everywhere. It is dark and round and mysterious. And from it, life springs, even if that life is only a well-cooked stew. She laughed, and I laughed with her half-embarrassed, half-still ill at ease. What have I gotten myself into? The earth is the same as the cauldron, Trisha. The nurturing powers of the feminine grow something wonderful from the dark womb that is our mother earth. Although most people take this for granted because they are disconnected from the natural world, it is still true. 
The mother gives us everything, air, food, water, all our plants, our trees, our wood, our fabrics, even our animals. It's all offered from the bounty of mother. Life germinates in the womb. This is true for all creatures. It is part of the great mystery of life, death, and rebirth. Cauldrons represent the alchemical laboratories that symbolize the nature of women and sacred life. This is also why the cauldron was used in alchemy. Alchemy? I swallowed my adrenaline humming. What do you mean, alchemy? She laughed, seeing my discomfort, but her voice was patient. Alchemy is transmutation, Shasta explained. Personal inner transmutation or chemical scientific transmutation, it's all the same. The alchemy of transformation is always done with the four elements because that is the paint box of the divine. I held her eyes but didn't speak, thinking about her words. The paint box of the divine, what a strange thought, but true, I realized. I wanted her to go on. She sighed, let me ask you a question, Trisha. What do you think the world is made of? I looked around the trees, the sky, the bench, my own clothes. I wasn't sure what she wanted me to say. Elements, elements, she said plainly, lots of elements, like those you find on the periodic table. And each of these elements is composed of some combination of air, earth, fire, or water, aren't they? Yes, I thought that was true, wasn't it? It was also a proportion of these four simple elements, plus the element of life or spirit that animates it. When Shasta put it like this, it was easy to follow. She continued. So all science is the study of the elements and how they respond to one another, whether it is the science of chemi chemistry, biology, astronomy, physics, or even medicine. From her herbology to pharmaceuticals, we are talking about how things combine, how they transmute and change and interact with one another. That's alchemy, isn't it? Yes. And so let's pause here for a second and talk about that. Because as I've said, the dark cannot create anything. It can only mimic the light. And as I've also said, both sides in this polarity, the darkness and the light use the same tools, right? Just like tarot cards. The good side and the bad side are using tarot cards. The cards are just cards. It's the conduit using it. So when we look at pharmaceuticals, of course, pharmakia is the Greek word, which actually means sorcery, right? And herbology is using God's plant. So in true, in true alignment with nature, you're going to use plant medicine because that's what God gives us. We're going to combine the herbs and the plants to heal people. In the Luciferian side of things, we're going to use pharmacia, chemicals, right? Because they're trying to be God. They're going to use the elements to try to connect that themselves. But it's both alchemy. One is for the good and one is for the bad. It's both alchemy. I hope that makes sense. She was right, I realized. Science is basically the empirical study of how the universe works, how it combines and operates within our abilities to perceive its laws. Shasta went on, but there's a deeper level of working with the elements that is known as the great work. This is the alchemy of the human soul, and it is done within the laboratory of time. I opened my mind to let these ideas come in, the past, the present, and the future. These were all known in ancient mythology as the three fates, the three norms that sit beneath the one world tree. One world tree, I asked. A symbol of the absolute behind it all. I looked at her hard, trying to follow what she was saying. She smiled, as if dismissing a subject that was too large for the moment. Anyway, that is what we do here in this grove. Transformation, connection, prayer, ceremony, the alchemy of connecting the soul with the divine behind it all. That's the magician's quest, I thought, the philosopher's stone. These were part of the secret societies connected with a search for the Holy Grail. I knew that for centuries there were legends of medieval alchemists who sought the formulas that would turn lead into gold, create the fountain of youth, and allow them to obtain immortality. These were clearly metaphors for something far deeper. Yeah, because you are the Holy Grail. This is what Shanti talks about a lot, and I do as well through yoga, that you are the Holy Grail. It's you. Surprise! That's the plot twist. You're the Holy Grail. You watching right now, you're the Holy Grail. You have the ability to turn your lead into gold. You are the alchemist. It's all about you. Shasta went on. Whenever someone goes to church to worship, the churches uses the same elements, don't they? The Catholic fathers took this knowledge of ritual and ceremony from the priestesses long ago because it engages the inner senses as well as the outer ones. 
I thought about what she was saying. Yes, they did use air, earth, fire, and water. These four elements were part of every religious ceremony I had ever attended. The burning of incense used both air and fire. So did the lighting of candles. Water was intrinsic to baptism and the sprinkling of holy water, which represented cleansing. Drinking wine and eating the communion wafers were part of the earth, as well as the golden chalice. The sacred cup would represent anything from the act of receiving to the womb of the Holy Mother herself. At the Eucharist, we would even say, take, eat. This is my body that was given for you and for all of men. Shasta was right. This was how most, most beautiful ceremonies were done in virtually every religion. And so I am going to say, as I've noticed in this book, there are some places where the author of this book is still very much programmed into the matrix even though she's pretty awake and catholicism is satanism communion is cannibalism but yes they did steal elements of rituals from the light from the priestess hood of isis right invert everything the narrative they tell us that the priestesshood of isis and osiris were bad and that christianity is good flip it it's all flipped Okay. And so everything they're doing in the Catholic services or Christian services in general is an inversion of the light. It's serving Lucifer. It's an inversion of what is good. So it, even though it might look the same and they're using the same elements, they're doing alchemy for the dark, not for the light. Cannibalism is never good, guys. It's never good. They used the four elements because they work, she said. Now she opened her hands and gestured around the yard. Now look around you. This is the goddess's true cathedral, Trisha, made from the natural elements. This is why our ancestors built campfires and sat around them. It wasn't just to stay warm or cook food. It was to dream with the fire. Anyone who has gone camping knows this. When we stare into the flames, we enter an altered state, a place where our vision takes us beyond the mundane things of life into the dream time. She looked out at the grove. Those cauldrons were merely holders for the alchemical fire of transmutation like the chalice. It is as simple as that. And again, we talk about fire in the body because we have to have fire. We have to have sweat. We have to have grit of friction in order to transmute. That's the fire in your body. That's why sweating is important, right? If you're all the old religions, the priestesshood of Isis, all of them incorporated physical exercise, physical movement, because that's that's the alchemy within you as the conduit, the fire, the chalice, the fire in the chalice, right? No wonder they've painted the, the cauldron as being bad because the cauldron holds that fire. Again, it's the womb, right? Once you see it, you can't unsee it. This is why they made it bad. This is why they didn't want you to look at it. This is why, I mean, nothing pisses me off more in this world than birth control. And I'm not saying that everyone should have like 20 kids. I'm not saying that there are ways to plan your family and to not get pregnant without using chemical birth control. I've never been on birth control, nor will I ever go on birth control. My womb is too important. I'm not going to do that to my body. All right. And I'm 39 and I've never gone pregnant. Okay. It's possible. All right. It, they, they, they want, they do these hysterectomies. They want to put us on birth control. They want to put IUDs inside of us. Guys, girls listening. They're trying to take the Magdalene away from you. That is the cauldron. That is the Magdalene. That is the holy womb is, is the womb of the woman, right? Your, your womb is part of your special powers. It's your portal. Why are you going to mess with it? Don't do that. All right. I took a deep breath. Her words were part of something I'd always felt as if nature itself were the real holy place, not a house of worship. I realized then that my silly fears were part of a rigid prejudice against all other faiths spawned by my own Christian upbringing. It was based on ignorance. We had always been taught that anything earth centered was evil. Although stepping back from it now, I realized this was patently absurd. The earth was the only reason any of us had life at all. Each day we ate from her, drank from her, and breathed her air. How could anyone consider, consider that evil? It was like separating yourself from the sacredness of God. Even though I thought I had graduated long ago from the overt oppression of the church, clearly there were still pockets of this upside-down logic left in my psyche. As beautiful as organized religions can be, I had long ago realized that the church separated people by assigning blame and judgment. I had long been on a path of listening to that inner voice that speaks to all of us who come in purity of heart. Yet until that moment, I hadn't realized how firmly the fear of witches had been implemented on in me. Are you a witch? I blurted out. 
blushing my scarlet with my own lack of tact. She laughed and shook her head unruffled. No, a witch is a person trained in the wicked path. Not true. That's not true. Again, the wicked path is um, newer. Okay. That is not my training. My path is the path of the goddess. I am the priestess of the divine mother in all of her forms. But my personal circle is Isis, Kuan Yin, and Shekmet, the cat-headed being that you saw inside. The Wiccans work with both male and female deities. Is that why you have three cauldrons? I asked, trying to keep my distress from my voice. She smiled. Yes, they represent the triple goddess. I had no idea what she was talking about. She saw that and went on. There are the three stages of life that everyone lives through, the maiden, the mother, and the matron. These complete the will of life, death, and rebirth. The divine mother encompasses them all. Hmm, I had a lot to learn. What about God? I asked a bit petulantly. Where does God fit into all of this? Her eyes blaze. Trisha, the male version of the crater, has, been, has had plenty of press these past few thousand years. Not true. But we'll continue. Like I said in the beginning, the patriarchal society is not the masculine God. It's not the divine masculine. It's Lucifer. Okay, let's, let's get that straight. The divine masculine has also been robbed and changed and suppressed, just like the divine feminine. There are many advocates for vengeful, punishful God, a God who separates and divides, who judges and condemns, a God who destroys or conquers everything that will not submit. I felt the power touch her like a flame. I, for one, choose life. I choose a creator who unites. I choose peace and unity, not division and war. Our, our world has seen enough of that to last many lifetimes. So again, the patriarchal God is Lucifer. Divine masculine God has also been suppressed, just like divine feminine. The divine masculine himself has also been, not only should we be celebrating the divine feminine, but we should also be celebrating the divine masculine coming back into balance too. We can't have one above the other guys. It's not about the females being up here and the males being down here and then flipping back and forth. It's equal. It's equal, right? And the divine masculine and the divine feminine were both shoved down to allow for Luciferianism. Makes sense to me. She was right. Condemnation and punishment, original sin, blame and shame seem to be the root of all patriarchal religions from Islam to Christianity, all Luciferian religions, not divine masculine. They said they revered women and yet they oppressed them. They said they, bring, they were bringing forth the teachings of the prophets of love, yet they were more eager to tell you that you were going to go to hell. Exactly. Luciferianism. To me, something was fundamentally wrong with any version of the creator who would only bless one group and send the other into oblivion. Yet this was the world that we have born into, a world where men taught oppression in the name of God, and their way was taking the entire planet down a path of abuse. We saw it in the exploitation of children, the killing of animals, and the pollution of natural resource. They gave no thought to the generations that would come after. Their only concern was for their own profits right now. Again, that's service to self. That's Luciferianism. That's not, that's not, I'm going to stand up for the men right now. That's not patriarchal. That's Luciferian. Patriarchal society is matched with the matriarchal society. It's divine masculine. There has been no, no masculine. It's the divine masculine has been pushed aside too, just as much as the divine feminine. Because when you take away the intuitive arts from a man as well, you're, you're crushing the man too. I hope that makes sense. I remember that the creed that our Native American ancestors had tried to live by, make no dis decision that does not serve seven generations forward. This ensured that we would become wise stewards of the land and the people. I flashed on the words of the Bible, and the tree shall be known by its fruits. Well, our culture and its fruits clearly sprang from a warped and twisted tree. The seven is a big, it's a God number. They say that with yoga too. So if you practice yoga in this lifetime, you are cleansing the karma, karma of seven generations behind you. And you're changing the karma of seven generations after you. So seven is a big number. Shasta's voice cut in, pulling me from my contemplation. But who remembers the great mother who actually creates everything? The one who gives everything on this planet life, who honors her? Tears spring to my eyes. I could not, I could think of nothing to say. And I will add to that. Who honors the masculine creator as well? We've been honoring Lucifer this whole time, not source creator, father and mother. So not only does the great mother need to be understood again, but also the father as well, the true father, not Lucifer. All things are born of women, Trisha. 
Shasta continued in a voice soft with power. It was so plain a truth that I could not believe it had never occurred to me before. She was right. Nothing would be born or live without the creative power of the female. Show me one living creature born of a man. It doesn't happen. The best we can offer is the androgynous earthworms. Also, I think, um, what are they called? Horsefish? Or, uh, you guys know what I'm talking about? Doesn't the male carry the baby in the horsefish community? I don't know. Let me know in the comment section below. I laughed out loud. The image of men claiming supreme dominance as a huge, aggressive earthworm was just too fantastic. The laughter broke the tension. After a moment, Shasta joined me, and I knew we were visualizing the same thing. Honestly, Trisha, in all the cosmos, it's only the mother who is the life giver. How can God be male, I ask you? Males do not give birth, do they? I looked at her, and beneath the mirth, there was a serious glint in her eyes. She is both the queen of heaven and the mother of earth but she has been forgotten by her children, dishonored and mistreated. When you come here to this grove, you honor her. I looked out at the ragged beauty of the half willed garden hidden by the kudzu. Just like the goddess, I thought hidden, unless you had the eyes to look for her. Shasta's words brought an entirely new way of thinking into my world. I realized then that in some strange way, I had always accepted God as being male. I had accepted the inner picture of some guy with a long white flowing beard who judged and punished us if we didn't do as he said. Shasta, I turned, knowing my prescience gifts were speaking. I know that the time will arrive when I will come here to study with you, but that time is not yet. There are other things I must do first, but I'm sure this is why the priestess of Isis contacted me in that dream. She nodded. So when I'm ready, will you teach me? A mysterious smile played around her lips. She fixed me with her piercing eyes. So shall it be. In the years to come, may you discover for yourself the answers to who the Great Mother truly is.